Stefan Beskiri. Uh, no need to introduce this guy. I think everybody knows him. Uh, it's Benedict Pem. <laughs> Really? <laughs> really? I think so. Okay. You don't think so? <laughs> I don't think so, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a, a manager of Dynafit or Dynafit or Dynafit. 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 <laughs> okay. So, it's, I'm really glad to have you here and I want to uh, pose some questions. Uh, and the first is, uh, do you remember when you realized that your harp is completely, um, completely in love with mountains. Good question. I think I realized that I'm in love with mountains. Uh, let's say when I didn't have the mountains anymore, because mm -hmm. I went for the mountains were there always from a small age onwards, and then I was studying in after my army, and mm -hmm. I was also in the middle of the mountains doing my mm -hmm. army service. In a, in a special force, in a special mountain force, but then I was studying in England and suddenly I felt something is missing and I, oh. I didn't even know what, you know, and then suddenly um, I found out it's the mountains and, and I suddenly, you know, realized that I have this great love, which was oh. so given, it was, mm -hmm. was just so granted and suddenly I became really, then I became really mountain fanatic, even before, even much more than before and then, and then after my studies I even decided to make that my mm -hmm. occupation, so my passion, my love, really yeah. my my living, my occupation, and then I started with dinner food. Okay, so it's a quite long time. It's it's quite a long time because you know it was naturally starting because I was a cross country skier, mm -hmm. and as a cross country skier, our club had a had a had a little hut mm -hmm. in the middle of like a self supplied hut. There's wow. no cable car, nothing in the okay. middle of the mountains, and you had a beautiful free, wow. free uh, view on the. On the highest, some of the highest eastern Alps uh, mm -hmm. peaks, like Kosinidiga, Kosloka, uh, and so on, and uh, yeah, but it was always there, you know. It was always I, I, yeah. I felt already it's there's a strong relationship, yeah. um, but then again, then later on when it was not there anymore, then he suddenly yeah. realized what's what's so, missing. So the benefit, it's uh, like your your kind of living your life. You are enjoying and working, and it's together, all together. So you are living your dream because you are working with um, people with the sa same set of mind, uh, with lovers of mountain uh, sports, and uh, maybe you are you have to be happy. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am very happy, and I I see that we are, um, and also I'm very lucky that yeah. I'm that I'm. I mean that we are able in Europe in general that we can choose our. Our most of the time our occupation and that we have this freedom to really follow our heart. It's not that's not again it's not given. I mean yeah. if you look if you go to other countries, we live in Europe very special lives and very unique lives which most of the people are not able to live. And yeah, and I'm of course super happy that I um, found this way. It was not easy because I didn't know 20 years ago. It was exactly 20 yeah. years ago. <laughs> you know, I didn't know how to make a living out of ski touring, out of mm. the ski touring passion because. Mm -hmm. It was not like, you know, like that because I didn't, I, there was no professions in there. That's right. You know, there were very few jobs and, and these jobs were not very attractive. So, mm -hmm. you know, like in terms of starting my career, this was not the most attractive way. My, my friends, I'd been studying in England, as uh -huh. I said, they made much greater careers in the beginning and they were, at, you know, uh, consultants companies like McKinsey and Boston mm -hmm. Consulting and big, great companies yeah. with great salaries and trainee programs and so on. And I started at Dunafit. From zero. From zero. Yeah. I mean, the, the, com the brand was at the time more or less bankrupt. I mean, it was bankrupt wow. more or less. So, mm. so it was really, but it was that passion and to say, hey, we can... We can do something out of that. We mm. can not only do something out of that brand, but and out, of the, out of the entire sport. And since then, and back to your to your question, since then it's just been an incredible, amazing journey. Of mm -hmm. course, with a lot of setbacks. Mm -hmm. So also in Dunafit, we had a lot of setbacks, a lot of failures, a lot of problems. You know, it was not everything it has like to be, right? exactly. It was not everything yeah. just up, up, up. Yeah. There was also product problems, uh, recalls. I remember in Christmas, and you know, a lot of yeah. things which were really hurting, but. Step by step, you know, you see how this baby is growing mm -hmm. and how people are coming. And as you said, what I enjoy most is to have a really amazing team. You know, it's a yeah, brand by great. athletes for athletes. And, and they're so cool people. Not only the people who work for Dinner Pit, but also like you guys, you know, <laughs> dealers all over the world, um, stakeholders. So it's like a big family. Yeah. And you, you, and all of them have the same passion. All of them know why they, why they are here because they, yeah, they want to bring people to, to the best yeah. sport in the world, mountain sports. It's a cool community. 
Right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about your uh, last uh, Himalayan adventure? Last Can you tell us something? <laughs> what do you want to know, especially? Cho <laughs> Oyo. Uh, Cho Oyo. Um, yeah, Cho Oyo is the sixth highest peak in the world, and I wanted to do that actually already quite some time in the past, mm -hmm. but it um, often didn't work out because Tibet was closed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always closed again because of political reasons, and yeah. also this year it was very tough to get in. You know, mm -hmm. there were. Um, Tibet was more or less closed now for the past four years and yeah. I think this year was the first time that, that they gave some visas to some people mm -hmm. so I think in total it was maybe only 100 people who were really? allowed to go it's in not yeah. much. it's not yeah. much at all maybe it's better for the nature it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe it's better for the nature on the other hand if you have the base camp already there um, yeah. I mean it's a massive area mm -hmm. um, but you know many many people were not even able to get a visa mm -hmm. you know there were mm -hmm. quite some even famous Americans and so on who didn't get a visa because mm. of, I don't know, 20 years ago they were showing a Dalai Lama yeah, picture right. or I don't <laughs> know what. So it was quite, um, I would say, uh, for, for a European, you know, who is used to have freedom, mm -hmm. freedom of speech, freedom mm -hmm. of movement, mm -hmm. and that was suddenly gone. And that was also mm -hmm. an interesting experience yeah. because um, before the border, it was really about checking the mobile phone if you have anything, really? which is maybe, uh, yeah, which is maybe provocative for right. the Chinese government, etc., and so on. So um, we were all checking our phones, mm -hmm. trying to get rid of all this because you didn't know maybe the phones are checked. And then mm -hmm. on the other side, um, so on the Tibetan side, on the Chinese side, there were securities waiting and they were following us all the time. So oh. they were with us, you know, you. And every hundred kilometers, you had a police station, um, and you have to imagine there's nobody there. So it was a permanent control, mm -hmm. and it was also that you're not free in terms mm -hmm. of movement. So when we came to these small villages, um, it was not that you just go for a walk. You know, it was like, hey, you have to, you, you cannot go there, you cannot go here, you oh. cannot go what. And I was a little bit surprised because nine years ago I've been to Tibet, and it was already you felt this, let's say, control state, yeah. but you yeah. didn't. There was no um, restrictions limits. Or yeah, something. there was yeah. no restriction, no limits on, on movement, um, like where you want to go. It's quite basically. a big change. It was right. a big change. No, it was really full control and mm -hmm. you felt like it's not really wanted, you know, yeah. and then and this went further and further because these restrictions um, were so strict somehow that <laughs> even I was not allowed to ski down Choyo. Okay. And you asked me about Choyo, so mm -hmm. I choose Choyo because it's, I think, one of the best peaks for 8,000 meter peaks for skiing. Yeah. And uh, and of course it's part of my strategy because the skis are not only because we love skiing but yeah, also yeah, it's uh, our strategy to escape quickly out of the death mm -hmm. zone if something mm -hmm. is wrong because we are fast and we have no oxygen and, and no mm -hmm. outside help so we if something goes wrong it's our escape the best way exactly the escape and and so my whole life I specialized on on skiing on <laughs> yeah. ski mountaineering and then suddenly no skis anymore <laughs> and but anyway I mean you have to you have to accept it I try mm -hmm. to negotiate set up your mind yeah exactly yeah. you have to switch the mind and that's <laughs> it and then the the closer we got to the mountains the more my heart opened yeah. because we kind of we got more free and free and then you know no controls was, exactly okay. then then there was no control even though there was a lot of uh, army and stuff in, in oh, base okay. camp even. And they controlled if I had ski or not. They really <laughs> controlled it. Um, yeah, and then and then on the mountain itself it was was amazing because I was together with um, this Nepalese pro climber yeah, yeah. called Prakash, and and we are really good. Team. And he he was quite quick. Yeah, he's there. very fast. Yeah. He was he was very fast because I was zero acclimatized, so yeah. I was not in I was not even on three thousand meters. Yeah, he's used to be and he's there. used to be he's okay. also a mountain guide, so he was guiding the whole season. He was already on six seven thousand meter peaks just oh. before, so he was fully. <laughs> Apart from that, that he's, that he's yeah. very good acclimatized always. Well. And uh, so I had to catch up. And this was maybe the fastest 8,000 meter peak I ever did because after six days in base camp, we almost reached the summit. We turned around 100 meters, 100 altitude meters mm -hmm. before the summit because um, there was total whiteout. Oh. And we were scared that we lose the way. And we oh, are, yeah. so it was really white, white, white. And I had experienced once in Broad Peak and another 8,000 meter peak where um, a friend of mine like fell down oh, no. because he was not you didn't see nothing you know okay. this and he was blinded it. yeah it was really blind you know you, yeah. everything is white and there's if there's a big you know crack or or, um, or hollow or something yeah exactly then you don't you don't see it. it you know you okay. you think everything is uh, then suddenly so 
we turn around. the dark. Exactly, yeah. because you don't see the contours anymore. And then, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and then we went back down. And then we started 10 days later, so four days mm-hmm. later after mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. first ascent, we started for the speed ascent. And 10 days is very quick for acclimatization, yeah. for me, you know. Yeah. So uh, usually you say you need at least 20 days for acclimatizing. Ooh. And after 10 days... It's a time. Exactly, I was... I was not feeling 100% <laughs> okay. and then we were pushing, pushing and after 12 <coughs> hours, 35, we reached the summit, um, totally alone. And uh, yeah, and after 19 hours, we were back in, in base camp and it was very intense. Yeah. And then two days, two, two, three days later, I was already back home. Oh. <laughs> so all in all, uh, very lucky, very fast expedition, even though I had to wait for my visa five days in Kathmandu. Mm. I think the entire expedition took not even three and a half weeks, so it was was very fast. When Maybe it it's a record, no? I, I don't know, but, <laughs> but for let's say for speeding and for not using oxygen and everything, I think it was at least it was my fastest expedition, okay. and it was also my my fastest eight thousand uh-huh. peak. So, so congratulations! No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, what about your uh, new headquarters? The new Dunifet headquarter. So yeah, the Dun- new Dunifet headquarter. And, and also for all who are, who are watching, you know, <laughs> you're more than welcome. Uh, from the beginning of May, I think it will open. Mm-hmm. And it's right based in Kiefersfelden. You don't have to know this place, mm-hmm. but Kiefersfelden is right. It's on the Bavarian side. It's right at the border uh, between Bavaria and Tyrol, Austria. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kufstein, maybe the one of the most. Uh, yeah. It's right in the center. If you would draw the center point between Salzburg, Innsbruck and Munich, then so this is the exactly. Place. Then you, okay. you find this spot. So it's in the triangle. You you would find this spot, and so it's in the middle of the mountains. It's a beautiful, um, yeah. It's a beautiful building. I think also mm-hmm. there was a big um, competition with a couple of top European architecture offices, mm-hmm. and uh, actually a Catalan, a Spanish mm-hmm. Spanish architect uh, architect won, and they made this this great building. And I think it's really a landmark in the in the entire era. But it's also it's also a home for mountaineers, so it's not only for the workers, you know, for yeah, the uniform yeah. employees, but it's really a home for mountain athletes. So mm-hmm. there's a big public area. Okay. We call it Speed Factory. So it's all <laughs> about the art of speed, understanding that speed is not something crazy and crazy people or whatever. It's actually an art in terms of, um, yeah, you allow yourself to be fast if mm-hmm. you have the right technique, the right mm-hmm. preparation, the right physical, mental preparation, etc. And you can build your own ski, so you can build uh, your custom made cool. ski with uh, your own wood, your own design, your own shape. No your, way. Yeah, really? so it's really cool. You can wow. come with a couple of friends, have a pizza, make your ski <laughs> in the evening. So it's, it's quite cool. Um, or your split board, so there's many ways to do wow. it. Or your alpine ski, so. Um, Sounds like a dream. It is like a dream, yeah. And then there's a big um, public, uh, let's say, shop, but it's, it's more, mm-hmm. this, this is what we call speed factory, so it's not a typical shop, it's really an experience more. Um, yeah, and then there's many other. There's a restaurant, of course, a public restaurant for where you get athlete meals, sort of recommended. <laughs> right. and so there's everything athletes, in one place. Everything in one place. The restaurant okay. is actually opposite the, mm-hmm. the, let's say, the main building. Mm-hmm. So it's outside. So in the summer you can really sit mm-hmm. nicely right, outside, yeah. and it's like a bistro. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Dunov et Bivak. So <laughs> yeah, so I think it's it's quite cool, and it's you're literally really. I mean, if you're on the way, and I think there's fifty thousand cars pass passing mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. you know on this mm-hmm. uh, way to the mountains on this gate to yeah. the mountains again i think a lot of czech people as well uh, <laughs> and slovakian people on the on the way so there's no excuse because in literally five seconds from the exit oh, okay. which is the last exit before the border right and um, you you are at the headquarters so mm-hmm. five seconds and you're there okay <laughs> and was it was it hard to find the right place right yeah, here it was it was you mean the right place for the mm-hmm. headquarters yeah. Um, yeah, it was hard, and it was especially hard to uh, convince the owner, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because we're still, let's say, um, yeah, um, um, how do you say, uh, management-driven uh, family mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that's a little bit like this, and there's the owner, of course, is a strong word. And it was not natural for him because, you know, in Munich we have our headquarters mm-hmm. today and this, this is our, it belongs also to the yeah. owner, you know, the, the real estate. And so he was not, I mean, it was not a natural thing that you say, hey, I take this investment. And yeah. we are very grateful that he took this investment. And I think it was also a little bit of a reward for the Dunafit team that um, in the past 20 years we, yeah, we had a, we had a great, you know, overall we had, a, mm-hmm. I think, a good success story. And I think it was a little bit of a reward to say, hey, now Dunafit gets really also own, yeah, yeah own, own home. And, um, 
And so it was not easy. I was proposing many different um, many different places. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, there was one all. Yeah, I don't want to go too deep, but there was one. Yeah, okay. But in this area, so it was clear that that we wanted to be in this area in between, as I said, in yeah. between the Salzburg and Innsbruck Munich, and we want to really go in the mountains mm -hmm. because this is where you said before, like yeah, the mountains are very yeah. long, right? Yeah, okay. So Munich is too far away from the mountains, and yeah, and finally we found this ground, and actually, you know how we found it. Mm -hmm. um, a dealer of ours, a competence, dinner fit competence center of ours, he called me uh, one day and he's in this keeper's mm -hmm. bed and he said, you know, Benny, uh, I know you're looking for a new, uh, for a new ground for the headquarter. I think I have something for you right at the highway. And then the owner said, ah, this is really cool. You do it. And then <laughs> okay. he bought the ground and then, yeah, we started. Sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> okay. Uh, 20 years and we had to pay 20 <laughs> yeah. years. Because when I entered in Munich 20 years ago, I said, you said it's like a dream, and I made my my I, I, yeah I realized it's my a passion. whole life dream. Yeah, it's right. a whole life dream. But at the time when I entered twenty years ago, I said if I one day have a leadership position in this mm -hmm. company, then I will work hard that we move okay. somewhere in the mountains because this was my only problem and um, the building and uh -huh. where the building is because I didn't find it appropriate for yeah. for a mountain sports yeah. company, not only for Dunavik right. but also for Saliva and so yeah. on. And I think now. Um, it's not only the home of Dunafit, but of course also mm -hmm. the other brands in this and yeah, yeah. um, for these markets. So mm -hmm. also for Saliva, White Country, for Mocha, uh, yeah. <laughs> La Bunt, what else you have evolved and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's interesting. Great. So what about in other sports, for example, cycling and you? Hmm. Cycling and me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mean me personally or yeah, yeah. with Dunafit? No, I mean you personally. Um, yeah, I mean, I always... Let's say I always loved cycling, and it was again um, was really my. I mean, I think for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. as, we, as we are kids, we somehow get a bike, and it's the first time yeah. where you have a little bit uh, where you experience freedom, and where you mm -hmm. suddenly experience, um, let's say, how do you say, um, the experience without help. <laughs> yeah, without help, and you experience movement, and you experience. Um, what it means to make your own self control, yeah, self control, yeah. self responsibility, also mm -hmm. because suddenly you're part of the, uh, let's say, of the entire travel traffic mm -hmm. ecosystem, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so you are you're really, um, yeah, it's the first time, and then and then I remember, I think when we were kids, right, it was super. I mean, we had much more freedom maybe than some yeah, kids right. today, and we were just going anywhere, and nobody <laughs> asked in the evening you were back or even not back, <laughs> didn't matter. So. So it was was great, and so the bike was very let's say a natural thing, and then I grew right into this when I was a yeah performance athlete in cross country. Mm -hmm. Then this whole topic of um, there was still road biking was big mm -hmm. for us, but also in the summer, but also then the entire mountain biking trend mm -hmm. came in the when was it beginning of the nineties or something yeah. when it became when it became big, and so I was always in there, but I was never let's say I was never becoming a full let's say competitive yeah. biker, you know. So okay. this was always like for me, I would say a training. Um, yeah. methodology okay. but that was it you know I was never interested I was, I mean, it's never interested there was just no time you know mm -hmm. it was really first of all a ski mountaineer and this mm -hmm. was what was all it and the, the bike was a great and is still a great training tool I love it um, and and that's also the reason why with Dinafit we we in the end um, enter entered many years ago already in the bike market because we saw there's a great overlap with our let's yeah. say winter athlete in, in that field and then it was natural to go there Okay, yeah. so thank you for the interview. Same to you. All the best. <laughs> Take care. Bye.